What's up there everyone, welcome here to another episode on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. My name is Elis Vaas and I'm a cardiac arrest survivor. Uh, I mean, the chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, that you too are a cardiac arrest survivor. Uh, this project has really been made for cardiac arrest survivors to provide support and insights and just ways um, to, to make this journey a bit less lonely and... Uh, slightly easier. Now in this Q&A episode, I had the pleasure to welcome Douglas Racek, uh, or known as Doc. Uh, and there, there might be actually a high chance that you have uh, heard his name before. Uh, he is a moderator of a few online support groups uh, around ICDs. And, uh, you know, that's what this Q&A will be about, about ICDs. This is an in-depth Q&A about ICDs because Doc has a lot of professional knowledge on ICDs, uh, but as well, and this is very interesting, uh, he also has personal experience because he has an ICD himself. Uh, now, Doc will give a much more in-depth also um, introduction about who he is, but I will leave that for him to do. Uh, but with that, you know, I will, <laughs> I will keep this intro short. I hope that you will enjoy this episode and that you will learn a lot. So please enjoy this conversation, this Q&A episode with Douglas Rajak. Doc, a warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. It's really, really good to finally meet and uh, to do this to do this interview. Yeah, it's nice to meet you finally, and uh, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. So um, I, you know, this is a Q and A episode. Uh, I gathered a whole bunch of questions from people listening or or from listeners uh, that I'm going to ask you because uh, the main topic that we're going to talk about in this conversation is ICDs, right? That's something that you have a lot of knowledge on. Um, but before I guess, you know, that I will ask those questions, uh, you know, could you just share a bit about who you are and, and where you gained all this knowledge uh, about ICDs from? Because uh, I guess some people know who you are. Uh, but for people who, who don't know who you are, could you just yeah, give us a, a bit of an introduction? Uh, sure. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm, I am a device patient. I have had an ICD since 2014, but my experience with ICDs goes further back than that. Um, when I graduated college in 1997, I uh, didn't have a job lined up. I had a political science degree, figuring mm. out what I was going to do in life. I thought maybe yeah. I'd work for a, a senator or in a campaign or something like that. So I was looking okay. for my first job. But to make some money, I went to a placement agency, just somewhere that puts you for a couple of weeks and then they move you around. And uh, because I had a, a degree and because I, I knew how to use Microsoft Word and PowerPoint and Excel, they put me at this company I'd never heard of called Medtronic. Uh -huh, and yeah. this was probably the most significant uh, thing that happened to me in my life. It's been such a, a, an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I started working as a temp at Medtronic in 1997. About seven months later, one of the positions that I was working at, they offered as a full-time job. And so I took that, not knowing really uh, a lot about the company at all. Yeah, it's a Minnesota-based company. It's right here in, in my home state. And I really didn't know anything about it. I had never heard of it before. Uh, I worked for Medtronic uh, for a number of years. Actually, um, I've, I've come and I've left. I've come and gone from Medtronic multiple times. Sometimes I've left uh, not, uh, not on my own accord. It was a layoff or a downsizing and my position was eliminated and had to leave the company. But between uh, 1997 and 2024, I worked for the company a total of 17 years. And most of it was in the cardiac division. I bounced all over the company, not really knowing what I wanted to do when I grow up. So I'm looking at all these different positions, uh, but I've worked in five different divisions at Medtronic. And uh, worked in six different, completely different functional areas like training and education and customer service, quality, uh, regulatory affairs. I ended up in marketing. Uh, my, my last time with Medtronic was just recently, actually. It just ended a month ago. And it was the consulting uh, position, a, a three-year consulting position with them. And we can, we can talk about that experience if you'd like. Sure, sure. But uh, my health issues started in, in 2011 when I was in the quality group at Medtronic and started experiencing some, some help, just some heart issues. I was, uh, you know, I'd, I'd stand up from um, my bed or I'd stand up at my desk and I'd get really lightheaded and had to pause for just a couple of seconds. And people would say, uh, you know, it was a head rush. Uh, that's what it felt like, just yeah, had, yeah. Had to pause for a minute. Um, mm. I would get a racing heart every once in a while. 
hmm. sitting in bed reading a book and all of a sudden my heart rate would be 120, 140 beats a minute for no reason at all. Um, once in a while, I'd get short of breath. So I'd run up a flight of steps and just not be able to talk for a few minutes, just be really out of breath. And that's unusual. I was, I was uh, you know, a pretty athletic person yeah. and in my 30s. Now, yeah. what's, what I, what's funny is that in 2011, that started and happened maybe once a month, maybe twice a month. And by 2013, it was happening every week. And working in the cardiac division, working with pacemakers, working with defibrillators, I know what heart symptoms look like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I was 38 and thought, this can't be happening to me. So I really ignored them uh, for the longest time. Uh-huh. And in uh, October of 2013, yeah. I had a, a fainting event. It was at 2 a.m. in our house. And uh, we had, we had a, my son woke up and my wife and I you know, went to go help him. And it was going to take about 15 minutes to take care of what, what happened there. And right in the middle of it, I got super lightheaded, got tunnel vision. I started sweating profusely, um, thought I was going to throw up. And so I made my way from his room all the way down the hallway through our bedroom into our bathroom collapsed on the toilet and nothing happened, but I felt better. I just started feeling better, but I was sweating profusely. So I sat down against the wall, leaned up against the cold wall. It felt really good. And uh, for about, I sat there for about a minute and a half, two minutes. And I thought, well, I, I better get up and help my wife finish this, uh, you know, getting back in bed. And when I got up, all the lights were off and there was no way she could have finished up that fast. And I said, what, what happened? And she said, well, honey, you've, you've been in the bathroom for 15 minutes. And there was just no way I was been in the bathroom for, yeah, I was not there for that long and not in my mm-hmm. world, but I ignored that too. You know, I just, uh, I thought, well, you know, it's Saturday morning. We were, we were having fun last night, drinking last night. Maybe I'm not 21 anymore. Um, I came up with every reason to say, this is, this is not a heart issue. This is not a health issue. Um, but again, it happened in 2014 in the summer of 2014. And this time I was out in Northern Minnesota camping with my boys. And it was just me and them. And we were in the middle of the wilderness where there is no cell phone coverage. Um, we were at a friend's campground or friend's ca- um, cabin. And we were camping in, in this camper out in the woods. And uh, about five in the morning, I woke up and used the restroom. And then on my way back, I, I collapsed on the floor. And this time when I woke up, I knew something was wrong. Uh, every time I tried to sit up or get up, I would black out again. Wow. And that was the first time I thought, uh, I'm, I'm going to die. This is how I die. But really weird, rational thought that went through my head really quickly was, well, if I die right here on the floor, my boys will be the ones that find me. And there were nine and seven at the time. And so I said, if I could just get back into bed, when they get up, they would go outside and play with the other kids and somebody would eventually come find me. So that was my goal. Um, I, I did, I get, get back into bed. And when I looked at the clock, about 25 minutes had elapsed. So it took me about, about 20 minutes to crawl eight feet and get back into bed. Uh, but then my heart calmed down. About two hours later, my son woke up. I sent him inside to go get my wife. Um, I felt fine. I was just tired. And uh, I took a three-hour nap in the cabin with everybody else. And then I felt great. And we went home. But we, know, we knew then that I, ha- I had to do something about this. And so we visited a cardiologist. Uh, he knew that, that, uh, you know, I, that I worked at Medtronic. My wife actually worked at Medtronic as well. By the way, sorry to interrupt. Did sorry. you ever share this with your wife? Yeah, I did a couple of symptoms, but probably not the full story. Yeah. Sure, sure. You know, probably not the full amount. Uh, I think when we had that discussion with the cardiologist, that was probably where she learned the full extent of, of what was going on. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, one, I think one of us had a, a Medtronic vest on or something. And so he, he, he learned, our cardiologist learned that we both worked at Medtronic at the time and uh, asked if, uh, you know, we wanted to skip the Holter monitor, skip the wearable monitor and go right to an implantable, right to a loop recorder. And, you know, those I know because working at Medtronic, I know those are much more effective at finding the correct answers. They're, they're uh, more accurate. And so I said, yeah, let's, let's do that. And so I got a loop recorder and about seven weeks later, I'm walking through the kitchen and I had a near syncopal event, a near fainting event, where my, my got tunnel vision. I mean, the vision was gone. And if you've ever passed out like that, and maybe you know this, yeah, uh, your vision goes away, but your hearing does the same thing, where it feels like it's like yeah. you're not getting surround sound anymore. It's getting you know, smaller and smaller to a fine point, and that goes away. Yes. That happened too. Um, and I had grabbed the countertop to like ease my way to the floor, but it, it ended. It stopped. And so I was fine. And it felt fine. And so uh, I made sure that the event was tagged. I used a little clicker to tag my 
event on my loop recorder that made the loop recorder record what happened. And it was a weekend, so I knew my clinic wasn't going to see it till Monday. So I went about my day and mm. we went to the party that night and we worked in the yard on Sunday all day and got really sore and, and uh, got a lot of work done. And then Monday, I forgot about it. And I think Tuesday, I forgot about it too. It was like, I think it was Tuesday afternoon when I thought, well, I wonder what that, that thing showed on the loop recorder. And I called my clinic and the, <laughs> the nurse looks at it and she says, oh, this is interesting. I'm going to show this to one of the doctors here and we'll call you back. <laughs> and they called me yeah. back actually the next morning. And I'm at work. So it's Wednesday morning. And they said, we'd like to, you to come in and, and do some tests. Yeah, and yeah. so I said, oh, all right, it's a real busy week. Let me look at my calendar. I've got some time Friday. And she says, no, we've got you scheduled for one o'clock today. You need to be okay. here by 1230. Oh, uh, okay. Well, uh, that, I, that was, I entered the hospital that day and did not return until the following Monday. Um, uh, I spent five days in the hospital. They did wow. three days of testing and could not figure out what, what, what there was going on here. What they found in the loop recorder was about four seconds of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. This is a really fast heart rate at about 100, uh, 240 beats a minute. And it was four seconds long. It was long enough for me to be on the verge of passing out. So I now know that four seconds of that will take me out. Um, and eventually we had one last thing to do, and that was an EP study where they go in with electricity and they kind of tickle your heart and try to figure out where that rhythm is coming from. Okay. And we talked about it with my doctor and said, if that doesn't work, the best option then to protect you is to put in a defibrillator. And both my wife and I were like, I'm, you know, I'm 40. Are you sure this is the next step? Mm. And he said, look, this is, this is a serious issue. It's getting worse. You, you've mm. talked about it getting worse. You've had yeah. at least one confirmed fainting event, probably two. Uh, you almost have a third here. Uh, and he said, you know, ultimately he said, you're young and you've got two young kids. What, what would you, why would you not do this? This is a safety net. Yeah. Uh, and so we agreed, okay, well, let's do it. And the yeah. funny thing is he knew we were, you know, Medtronic family too. And, and so he says, let's talk about the devices. And he writes down on an eraser board, he writes Medtronic and he puts a line down. He says, let's call this side other. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about all the other devices. So we talked about uh, St. Jude's device that delivers 40 jewels. We talked about the SICD. We talked about all the different defibrillators. And uh, my wife was in marketing at the time, so she's uh, got all the marketing points that she talks about with her customers. Yeah. Kind of funny to listen to the doctor in her talk. Yeah. And uh, ultimately, we settled on a Medtronic uh, defibrillator. And I do think that was the right choice for me. Um, and so, yeah, I got a, a defibrillator implant. I went from being a Medtronic employee yeah. to now being a patient. And I thought that was going to be wow. like this super easy transition. And turns out um, there was a lot of psychological parts mm. that came with it that I was not ready for. I was not aware of and yeah. was not ready for. Uh, and, and, you know, your, your last interview with Dr. Sears covered a lot of that. Right. Um, my anxiety went through the roof. My confidence in myself plummeted. And honestly, I could not perform the duties at, at my job. I just couldn't focus. Mm. Uh, simple tasks were taking me hours to get done. And then the work I was doing was really poor quality. Um, I felt, you know, I was, a, I was a high performer at the time and I felt like I was destroying my reputation. And so about nine months later in the middle of June of, um, 2015, I, I decided to leave Medronic and kind of wrap my head around this, this whole yeah, yeah. new world. I think it was just hard for me to, um, just kind of come to peace with the fact that this device that was supposed to save my life was designed and built by the people that I work with and that they were protecting my life. It just couldn't wrap my head around it. So uh, yeah, I left Medtronic. Um, you know, as a family, we decided I was just gonna take six months, kind of get my head on straight and then uh, uh, tackle the, the job market at the beginning of the year. And when that time came, my wife said, you know, we're okay financially and you do all of the housework while I'm at work and you take care of everything with the kids. So we get to play at night and on the weekends. We have a lot of fun because everything's done and we don't have to do the yard work and stuff like that. So she says, if you're, you're not ready, that's cool. <laughs> and so that six month break turned into about six and a half years. And mm -hmm. in that time, uh, probably the best thing I did was I, I started seeing a therapist that was, I mean, hands down the best decision. And, and honestly, anybody who's listening, who's considering maybe I should see a therapist, do it. It'll yeah, be, yeah. it'll be the best thing for you. Uh, and I think, you know, Dr. Sears really pointed that out, uh, in your interview with him. Yeah. Um, I saw a therapist for about two and a half years, and then I joined a couple of support groups on social media. 
And that was actually at my wife's suggestion. Um, and I ended up finding a couple of really, really good ones. And in reading what people were posting, I was starting to see a lot of gaps in knowledge, a lot of people who were looking for information but didn't know where to find it. And just having worked at Medtronic, either I knew the answer to the question or I knew where to find the answer, or if I didn't have the answer myself or I couldn't find it, I still had resources I could tap into, people that I knew and say, hey, this question came up. Can you, can you kind of explain it to me a little bit more? Um, so I started using those, those resources to answer these questions. And eventually I started answering the same question over and over again. You know, people ask about magnets like once a week, once a month. And so what I did was I created a YouTube page and created videos that explain these things, probably in a little more detail than is necessary. I'm a little more uh, nerdy and uh, you know, technical. But with some I don't think people videos. mind. I don't think people mind. I think that's good. I, I try to put, get, give a little history when I can and yeah. um, a little more background knowledge, uh, kind I of like that. inside knowledge. Uh, so you, you can find my YouTube page and I've got a bit, about 30 videos that explain different things. Yeah. I will, um, by the way, for listeners, put it in the show notes, uh, you know, to find the, the YouTube page. So, yes, I think it's good. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, you know, now I'm now I'm moderating three uh, Facebook pages and one on Reddit. Um, yeah. I I do a lot of work with. So which, which are the ads. sorry, which are the support groups? So it's the living with an ICD on Facebook, right? Living with an ICD. Uh, oh, Reddit Facebook it's... support group. Yeah. Uh, and then the third one is. Uh, about, about three years ago, I created a living with a Medtronic pacemaker ICD CRT device page, uh, kind of with the intention of, of giving some inside information and, and maybe getting some interviews from people that I know um, that didn't pan out quite yet. And, and, and that's really because I went back to work for them and, and mm. didn't have the time and, and uh, just wanted to uh, you know, really focus on, on some of the consulting that I was doing. Uh, yeah. But the one on Reddit is uh, the subreddit is pacemaker ICD. Yes. So people... Uh, listening, I will also put that in the show notes because they're great support groups. Yeah, yeah, I think they're really good. I mean, tons of uh, tons of um, experiences from different yeah. patients. There are some um, healthcare professionals that chime in every now and then, or even some industry people that chime in. And you know, I try to help connect people to the correct information yeah. and uh, the resources that are available out there. Sometimes they're hard to find, and so I try to connect them to that. And uh, I I, I'm, I read a lot of studies, so whenever a cool study pops up or a new product comes out, I try to give a little rundown on, hey, here's this new interesting product that came out. So it, it's been fun. Um, it, it's, been a, it's been a really great thing for me personally to be able to do this. I think it's given me a lot of confidence back and uh, it's been good for my recovery. Uh, and then about three years ago, a, a former colleague of mine approached me and said, hey, we're, we're doing something here. We want to do a resource for patients. We realize that it's hard to find information on our websites. And, and this was at Medtronic. And they said, we don't know what we're building yet. We don't know if we're building a website or a portal or an app or what we're doing. But we really feel like there should be patient voices involved in this. And we'd like to have you come in. And they knew that I was connected on social media, but also that I had this knowledge of Medtronic as well, of how, to, you know, how things work and how to get things done. Um, that turned into a three-year project. We created, uh, we ended up creating a website. It's called heartdeviceanswers.com. And I'm, I'm really ah, okay. proud of what we've done with that. Um, and actually, one of the little, gives, little thing, treats they give me, a notepad, but I'll, I'll hold this up to the screen. And your, your, uh, your viewers can pause the video and use your camera on your phone. And that's a, U a QR code. And it'll take you right there. Ah, that's, that's a cool, key. oh, that's a cool QR, uh, QR yeah. code. I, mean, I like heart, that. That's yeah, uh, but it's it's a resource where people can ask questions. I mean, it's just it's about living with a device, living with a pacemaker, living with a defibrillator. What is what are heart conditions? What is you know ventricular tachycardia? What does a procedure look like? And if you dig deep enough into it, you will find videos of me uh, explaining <laughs> some of the answers. You also find videos of Dr. Sears. He participated in that project. Ah, cool. Uh, so yeah, uh, that that project actually led me to other projects at Medtronic, and ultimately I was working. Uh, about part time with the defibrillation group, and I was working on what we we call patient engagement. And it was my job to bring Medtronic and patients closer together, so that the patient voices can be heard more clearly. Uh, for seventy five years, that interaction, uh, that innovation was between like Medtronic engineers and doctors, and we'd always ask the doctors, "What do your patients want?" And they would tell us what they thought patients wanted. 
And then when you ask patients what they want, it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, yeah, yeah. you know, this, yeah. this job, I, I was given this opportunity to really create this job and run with it, which is absolutely the most fun I've ever had at, a, at a, a job. Like just, it's been so much fun. But I got to sit in on the meetings where decisions were being made. You know, if they're talking about what do are, what are defibrillators look like in 10 years, what's the next generation going to be like? I got to sit in on those meetings and offer my viewpoint on what it was like to be a patient. And uh, I'd bring other voices in. I'd say, oh, yeah, I heard this on Facebook and, and we can design to solve this problem. And the engineers were all excited. Like they were really um, fired up about doing work for the patient and, and improving products. And so I got to work on other things, you know, like educational materials. Uh, they had a new product come out called the EVICD. And I got to work on the um, educational materials for patients on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's, really, it's really great when uh, your colleagues like they really take your, your comments and they understand now, uh, for example, like we use language at Medtronic or, or at, in the industry, really, where we talk about shocks from a device, but we call it a shock therapy because it is a treatment. You have a cardiac arrest and the treatment is a shock. And so people refer to it as shock therapy. Patients don't talk that way. Like we don't, mm. we don't talk about therapy. And so you know, we would eliminate that word in, in all of the, the documents and it made more sense to patients to talk about a shock. So things like that. And uh, it was Really, a, really a great experience that ended a month ago. Uh, so I no longer work for Medtronic and make it clear I don't speak for them in any of the, anything that I say here. This is all my knowledge and experience that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I really hope that I get a chance to return to, to do more work because uh, yeah. I think we were doing some pretty groundbreaking things when I left. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a great, great introduction. Um, and I will say, I mean, you are... Yeah, the best person right now for me to invite here on the show to talk about ICDs because I love the combination of someone who has a lot of knowledge on the topic, but also has personal experience. So I, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, uh, w w I just the website that you just uh, said heart device. What was the rest? Heart, heart device answers. Answers. Dot okay, com. yeah. One word. Okay. Heart device answers. Okay, so also uh, I will link that in the show notes because. Uh, I'm going to check that. Yeah. Um, so let me throw some questions at you. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So kind of, oh yeah. And with each question, I also made a, a short summary because um, that can sometimes be helpful. So I'm going to paste the question in the chat here for you to also read while I read it out loud. Uh, so the first question is from Karen Harold. Uh, if I also pronounce any names incorrect, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So the first question, uh, I'd like to know if smaller ICDs with longer battery life are in development. If so, how soon realistically uh, are they likely to come to the market? Uh, there's a new pacemaker, the size of a pill that can be uh, fitted inside the heart. I know ICDs perform additional different functions, but could they ever get much smaller? Uh, and then there's another also being made from metal. ICDs are so hard and sometimes quite uncomfortable. Could they be made from another uh, silicon rubber type material so they are softer in the body? So it's a bit like two questions in, Great. in one. Yeah. And here's a summary. Um, yeah. How soon yeah. might we expect drastic changes in size from ICDs? And yeah, would it ever be made from a different material? Yeah, so uh, I, I've got a bunch of toys here from my time. Um, I, this okay. is, this is uh, what they're talking about with the pacemaker. This is called a micro. Wow. Um, I know that's Abbott crazy. and Boston Scientific also have this device. Yeah. This is the Medtronic version. So that's that's the pacemaker. And uh, to give you uh, a, an example, here's what a typical pacemaker looks like now. So this is a, what's what we call a traditional pacemaker. It has leads that go into the heart. Yeah. And this is the leadless pacemaker, which is inserted directly into the wow. heart. There's no leads. These little tines hold onto the heart wall. That's and insane. So, yeah. So the, the pacemaker technology has gotten very small. These wow. don't work with every pacemaker patient, though. They're, they're only, they will only work in about 50% of the pacemaker patients right now. Okay. Um, working on making that better. But can we make a defibrillator even you know twice this size? So that's a really great question. Mm. And there are a lot of... Um, of just physiological, or not physiological, uh, uh, technical problems that come with that. There's yeah. just some physics that are, is going to be very hard to overcome because what happens when a defibrillator fires is 
it has the energy in the battery, but the battery isn't strong enough to deliver the shock. And so there are capacitors that the battery okay. charges. And then when the, when the charge hits a certain rate or a certain, uh -huh. a certain amount, the capacitors fire and deliver that shock to the body. Uh -huh. That takes about mm, six to 10 seconds to charge yeah. the capacitors. Just basic physics, the capacitors and the battery have to be a certain size. And right now we, we can shrink them a little bit, but not, you know, not significantly. Like this is the size of, this is my device. This is actually really, believe it or not, this is my first implanted defibrillator. Oh, really? This is my first one. I got it back. And that's something you all should know. If you have a device explanted, you can keep it. You have to ask <laughs> for it, but you can keep it. Oh, you have really to ask cool. for so it. Okay. Mine. Yeah. So they can be smaller than this, but mm. maybe by a third, if the engineers are really good and they take a lot of time, how, how long would that take? Product development takes a long time. And it's because the device industry is heavily regulated, especially by FDA and groups like it outside the, the country. Mm -hmm. um, Europe has their own uh, uh, regulatory body, China, Japan, they all have their own. So um, it takes a long, long time to develop a product. The last defibrillator that uh, Medtronic released took 11 years to develop. So, wow. so a decade. is a smaller device coming out, yeah. possibly, but mm. it'll probably be several years. It would have to be in development now to mm. come out in the next five or six or seven years. Um, so it's a smaller device, but definitely not a, not a micro version. They have not been able to, to uh, figure out the physics to get it down to this size. Um, and the question about metal, um, yeah. this is really interesting. So when, when I talk about bringing patient voices in, this was one of my examples, actually, is that how do patient ideas about devices get to Medtronic? And really, in the past, the only way was through physicians. And yep. sometimes what the physician wants in a, in a device outweighs, in their mind, what a patient wants. But one of the things that did get through was the shape and size of devices. And these defibrillators used to be rectangular. They used to be square and rectangular with corners, not, not sharp really? corners, but rounded, but they were boxy. Yeah. And one thing that came out was doctors said a lot. My patients are complaining about the corners and the size. It hurts like to bump into things. Can yeah. you do anything about that? And the engineers said, well, yeah, sure, we could do that. And so they created devices with first with rounded edges. They're not square yeah. anymore. And then they also created it with curved tops so that it fits under your skin more physiologically and is more comfortable. So mine is under my skin. I don't feel it at all. I, don't, I mean, I, it's, it's a bump and mine's on my right side for, for anatomy reasons. Um, but uh, I feel it, but there are no corners that I catch. And uh, yeah. I don't, it's not painful in any way for me. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, they're, they're, oh, the question was though, can we make them with um, different material? Yeah. Different materials. And yeah, that, that has been discussed hmm. and really it's been discussed as more of a cost saving thing, especially for like um, uh, devices we, we would just sell in other countries like third world countries where they just don't have the, the resources, the money to afford some of these devices. Well, how do we make them cheaper? Well, one way is to make them with a silicone rubber. And I know that's been discussed. I don't know where that's at. It's certainly not on the market yet. Um, that's one thing I don't know is where that's at, but it has been talked about. I've seen the, 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 the prototypes are pretty cool. Hmm. Um, but I, I don't know that if that's ever coming out. Um, would it be more comfortable? It, it might, like um, but I, I actually think making these devices either smaller or, or yeah. rounded and, and yeah. implanting them deeper, you can implant a device under the muscle rather than just under the skin. Mine's actually under the muscle. I talked to someone uh, actually yesterday, another survivor who had her brother her ICD, his ICD was exactly inserted under the muscle. I never heard of that. Yeah, and that was uh, uh, something my doctor made available to me. Um, yeah. Especially my first one was under the skin, and I did feel it a little bit more. Okay. And uh, I commented on that, like that it was really prominent. And he said, oh, I can implant under, under the muscle if you'd like. Oh, it's so yours more... is? Sorry? Yours is under your muscle. Yeah. Oh. Mine is under the muscle. And, and it, it, um, it's mm. a little more invasive. I mean, they're, they're cutting Apparently. through the muscle then to put it under there. So it takes yeah. a little more time to heal. I think, I think my second procedure was more painful than my first one, the recovery time. Um, Were but, you awake also? Uh, not during the procedure, not me. Uh, okay. Some people are, some people are, yeah. but not me. Um, okay. And so I, 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 think it's, I think it takes longer to recover, but it was well worth it for me. I mean, I absolutely prefer this to my first device. Mm. So how many device replacements have you had? This is your I, second I had that you're one. on? 
I had one and I, I had a crazy situation. Um, yeah. This is mine. I think mine is a case study for one of the worst uh, implant procedures, not, not by any fault of the doctor at all. My body physiology just was nutty. I've, I've got a crazy anatomy that, that was very difficult to work with. Um, they started okay. trying to implant it on my left side. That didn't mm -hmm. work. So they implanted on my right side. And then my heart wouldn't convert during the, the defibrillation threshold testing. So they, they're able to test the device while you're asleep. They put your heart into a fatal rhythm and they, they wait to see what the heart does or what the device does. And mm -hmm. it's supposed to detect charge and shock your, your heart out of the rhythm. Um, I, I, the first procedure, I failed seven DFT tests, which anybody who's technical and is watching your show is going to say, wow, that's a lot. They, okay. they know that that's a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and it forced them to add a second lead in a place that it's not normally placed. And um, that, lead, that lead dislodged two months later. And so they had oh. to go back in and they reconfigured it and did it a different way. So it's much more secure. But during yeah. that procedure, I failed uh, 15 DFT tests. Uh, okay. The last two were successful. So they were trying to find a position for the leads where my heart would actually convert to a normal rhythm afterwards, you know, once the shock hit. Uh, so my, my second procedure was three and a half hours. I was beat up after that. Um, <laughs> that is absolutely the worst case. It doesn't happen. Most of these happen without any complications at all. And uh, people go home either the same day or the next day. Mm. You always have, of course, stories like yours, but... Luckily enough, those are not common. They're not common. Uh, yeah. I, I think you, you'll see them on the, the, um, the support pages more. Sure. Because really those people are the want people to share that in a way. Support. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the people who have bad experiences, they're yes. typically the ones that talk more about it. Um, exactly. But even those usually turn out, turn out pretty well in the mm -hmm. long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everything is fine now for you. Everything's great. Yeah. Um, okay. I have not had a, uh, a cardiac event. I have had a couple runs of, of, of uh, non-sustained VT. I've had a few times in the last nine years where I felt it and thought, Ooh, that was something. And the device recorded it, um, and confirmed that I, I was having some kind of heart issue, but I've not received any shocks. I've not received any treatment from the device at all. It's just sat there and watched my heart for nine years. And that's totally fine by me. Okay. So cause now I, I when I asked the question, I actually thought like, Oh, I should have asked a few more things about you. Uh, I'm thinking of it now, so I'll just ask it now. Um, do you take medication as well? Like, yeah? Yeah. I, uh, so okay. I take a, a calcium channel blocker called Verapinol. Ah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. a really light, uh, mm. kind of the first stage that you take. And that has done a lot for reducing. Mm. I mean, I, I don't have these symptoms anymore. I don't have uh, tunnel vision. I don't yeah. get uh, uh, lightheaded. I, maybe once a year, twice a year, I get lightheaded. Mm. Um, I don't have shortness of breath anymore. Like all because these of the medication or because of the ICD or both? Because of the medication. Yeah, because of the ah, medication. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's done really well for me. And I'm, I'm also actually on, I, I talk about this a lot too, I'm also actually on an anxiety medication. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's well, Butrin is the, uh, the formal name. I, I use a, a generic called Bupropion. But that has done wonders for me too. I mean, that has really helped me focus and, and keep my, my uh, anxiety down at a normal mm -hmm. level. And do... So they inserted an ICD in you because you were at risk of a cardiac arrest, right? Did well, they they figure... in, in the industry, they oh. call that primary prevention because they're, they're not sure that I've had a cardiac arrest. I might have had one at, in, in the uh, uh, woods in northern Minnesota. And mm -hmm. if so, I am incredibly lucky that I live wow. um, because I think, you know, the survival rates are less than 10% for cardiac arrest uh, victims. So... Um, but they're not sure that I had one. So it's called primary prevention. Whereas uh, you had a cardiac arrest, your device is, is technically known as secondary prevention. Right, right. Okay. And uh, just one more question, and then we'll jump to another question uh, yeah. from a listener. Um, do they know what's happening with your heart? Do you have some heart disease or, or did they figure they something out? They have no idea. Structurally, mm. my heart is great. My yep. ejection fraction is between 55 and 60, which is perfectly normal. Yeah. Um, every time my doctor sees me, he says, I see nothing wrong. They have no idea. So what they've identified it as, as idiopathic, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. So ventricular tachycardia is a really fast heart rate. Yep. Non-sustained means my heart corrects itself. So okay. it's not right. sustained where it would mm -hmm. need help up from outside. It's non-sustained, so it's, it corrects itself. 
And idiopathic, I like to mention, is a really fancy medical term that means we have no idea. <laughs> okay. So we have yeah. no idea why it's happening, but this is what you have. And then I also have episodes, confirmed episodes of fainting. Um, I think the, the run of non-sustained VT just alone wouldn't have been enough to get me an ICD. But the fact that I've been fainting and having all these symptoms, my doctor was just like, you're in this gray area. I do not want you to leave without an ICD. I see. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Let me throw another question at you and uh, along the way, maybe ask more questions about your case. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So here is a question. I'll paste it first. From Valerie Harwood, I've had an uh, Abbott Gallant. Oh, yeah. And I, I just added that's a company that makes ICDs, right? Uh, yeah. For about 11, uh, uh, sorry, 10 months now. Could you ask Doc to talk about what sets the ICD off? As my understanding is that it is uh, not simply a higher rate, heart rate, sorry, uh, such as when we are exercising. So, and then I'll just add this to it. Uh, what are various reasons why an ICD might fire? What are the various reasons? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, that's great. Um, so the, the devices have a couple of preset settings or they, they can be moved, but let's, let's talk about mine. Yeah. Um, mine is set to pace me if I go below 40, which it, I never have. So it doesn't pace me and it has a higher pacing rate. It'll pace up to a certain point. And quite honestly, I don't even know what that is. Uh, I should look that up. That's my device. I should know that, <laughs> but it also has, uh, for shocking, it has a couple of different settings. The first one yeah. is, uh, the setting where it will start to record. It'll start to look a little closer. Mine is set to 166. So when my heart rate gets up to 166, my device takes more notice and it will start recording that wow. what's going on. And so my doctor can look and say, oh, you went above 166 and here's what your heart rate was doing at the time. <laughs> um, and then it has a limit of when is it going to shock you? Mm -hmm. And mine is set for 196. Uh, that can be, I mean, it can be anywhere from, it could be anywhere from 160 to, I mean, I'm sure it can go lower, but it can go all the way up to. I think 240 or 280 or something like that, your doctor can set it for whatever uh, the, the, the rate they want to see. Um, mine looked at that loop recorder recording and said, you know, well, you were at about 240 here and you were almost, you were about to pass out. So we know 240 is where you're, you're going to pass out somewhere around there. And so we bumped it down. Uh, it was at 188, but I exercise a lot and I really push my heart rate a lot. And my doctor doesn't like that, but he's supportive. He says, I'm, you know, I'm not telling you to stop. I just wish you wouldn't, mm. uh, you know, you can work at lower heart rates and, and for longer times, but you know, you do you, I like to ride the Peloton and I like to compete against the other people who are, are on the Peloton. I want to beat them. And so that means you got to push really hard. So my yeah, heart yeah. rate was hitting 170, 175, 178. Yeah. And that's on my, you know, my wearable, my watch, my, my yeah. Apple watch. That's on my chest strap that connects to the Peloton. I'm watching these different things as I ride and I'm seeing, you know, 180 and I, I can't sustain that very long, but I back off. The problem is, is 188 is my shock zone. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't mean that if I hit 188, 188, I'm going to get shocked. The device has other things that it looks at. It's got algorithms, discriminators. It's got templates. It looks at, it looks at the heart rate and it says, yeah, even though you're over 188, is this a normal heart rate where the top chambers beat and then the bottom chambers beat? Is that normal? And so it will look at these things and decide, this is okay, you can keep going. But if you get too high, or if it starts to see things that are a little weird, like if, you're, if you've got your smartphone in your pocket and it's, and it's interfering a little bit with your device and it's making it look like there are extra heartbeats that aren't there, if the device gets confused at that point, it'll do the safest thing possible, which is to shock you. So I could be at 190 beats a minute and be totally fine. But if the device gets confused or sees something concerning, it'll be play it safe and it'll, it'll pop me. And so when I'm looking at my wearable heart rate monitors, those are not terribly accurate. And my doctor is saying, yeah, you're, it shows 180 or really 170. I can't really get that high. He says it shows 170, but if that's 10% off, you're right at your limit. Like you're, you're right there. You, you could get popped. So be careful. And so when I hit 170 now, I, I back off. I try to keep it in like the 165 range. Um, I, I joke that with my doctor that 
I try to sustain right around 166 so that he sees I'm exercising that hard and uh, he can scold me. So yeah, it's not just a number. It's not just a heart rate. There's a whole bunch of other factors that go behind it before the device will shock. Wow. Actually, hearing this makes me appreciate my ICD even more. You know, just, <laughs> just to hear the complexity of that small device and yeah. the engineering behind it. Um, yeah, because yeah, it's quite smart in many ways. And They're, um, They're pretty smart. You said with your phone, would, it, would something like that interfere with the ICD? In theory, um, you know, so anything okay. that uh, anything that has electricity flowing through it, any mm. kind of motor or engine generates a small electromagnetic field. And and it's it's an electrical field. It looks like electricity to anything that's measuring electricity. And that's what your your device is doing. Your device isn't looking for the physical contraction of your heart. It's not looking for that muscle to contract. It's looking for the electrical signal that travels through your heart that causes it to beat. Mm. And when it sees other electrical signals, it can get confused. So if you're using a power tool, let's say you're using a power drill and you're right up against your chest because maybe it's a small area and you're running it for a long time, that will might that might be picked up by the device. Now, there are, what I said, discriminators and templates built into the device. So they build in, they tell the device, what does EMI look like? What do different EMI fields look like? And the device can say, oh, I've seen that one before that's probably EMI. And within that, I can still see the heartbeat. So I'm going to focus on the heartbeat and, and ignore the EMI. Uh, but sometimes it gets too confused. Like if you're welding and you're not taking the right precautions, the EKG strip that you see will just be black lines and you can't see an underlying rhythm underneath it. You can't see that natural heart rate. And so the device would get confused by that and say, I don't know what's going on. This looks horrible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shock. So, but there are precautions you can take. Like with a smartphone, it does emit some EMI. It's a really low level. It's probably not harmful, but to be safe, the medical device companies say, keep it six inches away from your device. So don't put it in a breast pocket right by your device. Okay. But as you see, I'm putting it by my device. Why am I doing it? Yeah. Well, it's going to take time. If it's going to interfere with your device, it's not going to, it's not going to shock you right away if it gets confused. Because again, we talked about that charge time. Like yes. At a minimum, you need to give it uh, you know, two seconds to identify a problem, six seconds to shock or charge and shock. So you know, you know, there are EMI fields that we come into contact with. As long as we're not in that field for very long, we're not going to have problems. Those things can't hurt, hurt your device. They can't um, damage the components. They can't scramble the programming. It can't reset your programming back to factory settings, anything like that. Okay. It can just confuse your device. And as long as we're not, you know, hugging a blender while it's running, we're going to be fine. Okay. I, I, I joke about the don't hug that rule. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you have anything, can I use a, can I use a, a skill saw? Can I use a chainsaw? Don't yeah. hug it. Yeah. Don't hug it and, and you'll be fine. And use the precautions that the medical device companies give you, either six inches or 12 inches or sometimes 24 inches, like with an induction oven or, uh, you know, a really uh, high amp bench grinder. It's two feet. But otherwise, yeah, you'll be, you'll be fine. You can use normal items with a normal distance. If you're using your sock, your chainsaw correctly, you yes. Actually, maybe, I mean, because, you know, Karen asked a question, you know, the, the previous one, uh, more around the hardware. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask now a question, because I'm curious, because we're on this topic. What changes in, in terms of software are there coming that you know of that we could see in the next coming years or like in 10 years? Is there something exciting on the horizon? Well, I think the biggest thing with defibrillators is the worry of inappropriate shocks. Mm -hmm. And this is yeah, where the yeah. device shocks you when you didn't actually need it. Yes. Uh, and so there's been a lot of work done, even in the last five years, to reduce the number of inappropriate shocks. 10 years ago, I think the shock rate, the inappropriate shock rate was like 9% or something like that. 9% of patients would experience an inappropriate shock in, in any given year. And now that's down to like 2%, 2.5%. Um, so your chance of having an inappropriate shock are pretty low. It's, it's about 2% a year. Um, and they get better and better every year. I mean, every device that comes out seems to, to have a better reduction of inappropriate shocks because they, there is a lot of research going into how do we prevent those from happening uh, in the first place. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I yeah. think and that will put... Better, 
you, you, you mentioned the software that it, it gets better and better with detecting rhythms too. So detecting fatal rhythms gets better so that the, the therapy, the treatment, the shock mm -hmm. happens earlier uh, in the, in the event. Okay. Yeah. I think hearing this will put some people more at ease because the, the fear of having an inappropriate shock is definitely real uh, for people like us, you know? So if that gets lower, yeah, that would only be better for us to hear. Okay. Hey, sorry to interrupt the conversation between me and Doc. If you are curious, you know, where to get this very beautiful and comfy pullover or this stunning mug uh, with a great and beautiful quote on the back of it, this is some of the merch that we sell. Uh, and I mean, pff, basically everything that I earn from the merch goes directly again into the project. So yeah, it helps me to continue doing this project. Now we have some different designs. Um, this one is with the Heart Warrior project on it. Uh, yeah, so we have that on the mug as well. Uh, but we also have a design uh, explicitly meant for cardiac arrest survivors with I'm a Heart Warrior on. Uh, and we have that on the pullover, the mug, and the t-shirt. Uh, now I am working with more uh, artists that I personally know, and I'm really, really excited about that. Um, so there's more designs coming. So if you don't like any of these designs, then still check out the page where we sell the merch as uh, maybe some of the new designs are already out and they should be appearing in the next coming weeks or the next coming month for sure. Now in the description, I will place a link uh, where you can find the merch. Uh, or if you aren't interested in the merch, but you are interested to support the project, we do also offer donations, uh, which can be found also in the same link located once again in the description. Or you can also go directly to hardwarriorproject.com slash get involved. Okay, thank you for, you know, maybe considering to support this project by buying one of our merch or leaving a donation. Either way, thank you, you know, for being here. <laughs> uh, let's go back now to the conversation between me and Doc. Okay, let's go to another question. Uh, so this is from Nicole Brown. We are seven and a half months into my 53-year-old uh, husband having an ICD from Boston Scientific. He survived the Widowmaker and a cardiac arrest, uh, yeah, June 11, 2023. What are the restrictions? Um, maybe this question kind of goes into what you were talking a, a bit yeah. already about, but we get mixed responses from healthcare professionals, no chainsaws, no tillers in rough ground, no TENS pad therapy. Um, these are electrical nerve stimulation uh, things. Uh, yeah. So in short, maybe if there's something more that you could add, what are the actual restrictions uh, we have with ICDs? And as well, what are the most common restrictions you have heard people think they have, but actually are safe to use with an ICD? Is there just something more that you could share? Because you already did share quite a bit about this now. But Yeah, yeah I love this one because there, there's a lot of, of uh, uh, misinformation or old information that's out there. Uh, um, you know, just going back to what, what she was asking about, chainsaws can be used. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the medical device companies, first of all, the medical device companies all have uh, information on their websites for patients. Right. It's something right. They, they created a device called an electromagnetic compatibility guide, and they all have it. You can look that up. You can type in uh, Boston Scientific electromagnetic compatibility guide. Maybe okay. put a pacemaker in there too, and it'll pop you right to the page. And this is a document that they've put forward that says, "Here's all the things that you might use in a common, a common household or a common office." And mm -hmm. if there are any restrictions, here's what they are, or, or recommendations, really. Yeah. Um, there are very, very few things the medical device companies tell us don't use at all. Um, you know, one of them is, I'm, I'm trying to think of the list right now. One of them is a TENS unit on your, your core body. Um, the information on that is a little uh, vague. Um, you know, what I've heard from uh, doctors and engineers and what I've seen in the documents is you can use it on your legs, you can use it on your arms, not on your core body, because uh, yeah, it is putting okay. electrical stimulation into the, into the body, and that yeah. can confuse your device. Definitely don't use it on your chest. Yes. Definitely not. Or yeah. even on your back. Um, so TENS units, are, are you, you can in some situations. Uh, chainsaws can be used. That's a 12-inch distance. So 
you know, most people don't want to have the whirling chains of death more than 12 inches to, closer to them anyway. You know, they want to keep <laughs> that away from their body. So if you're using a chainsaw properly, you're going to yeah. be fine. Yeah. The tiller I have not heard of before. And I actually wrote that down. So I can what send is... that to my, my friends at Medtronic to say, hey, here's a question I haven't heard before. I haven't seen that on anybody's documents. Uh, oh, okay. Tiller. I didn't know tillers, what it actually is in English. It's, uh, it turns uh, up the ground. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But what I think of is I think of um, I, I, when I see something like that that's not on a document, I think of uh, other, dev other items that you might use. So I think of a lawnmower or yeah. a snowblower. Or yeah, that are similar. Powered, yeah, gas-powered uh, weed eater or something like that. And those are all based on the um, gas engine emits electrical stimulation. I think people are worried about the shock or the um, the vibration of a device. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your device yeah. is much smarter than that. It's not going to see a vibration and think that's a heartbeat. Because, again, mm -hmm. it's looking for that electrical signal. It's not looking for movement. So you can, you can ride a car on a bumpy road. You can probably use a tiller because the gas engine is down by the machine. It's down by the blades. And the recommendation for gas engines is one foot, uh, especially when you're working on a car. Like if you're a mechanic, don't lay across a running engine. It emits electromagnetic energy and that can affect your device. Uh, so arm's length, perfectly fine. Standing behind the machine should be perfectly fine. That's, that's one question I'm going to throw to my friends at Medtronic and ask them to put that up on the web page for hard drives. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is there like one thing that you know of that is definitely a no-go for people with an ICD? Well, they, uh, the engineers I talked to have put uh, biometric scales on the, on the list. Those are the ones you stand on, and they send an electrical impulse through your body, and they measure your body fat content. And they take about 20 or 30 seconds to, to run through the, the test. And there were studies or tests done years ago where they found that there could be an interaction between the device and, and the, that energy. And so that's one item that's been put on the list is, is tens of units. Um, there are just, a, there are very few items that are on the list. People are worried about induction ovens because, you know, they, they emit that energy that heats the pot and those are okay to use, but you should be two feet away from the countertop. And for some people, like if you have an SICD, that's the device that's on your left side oh, or yes, the EDICD yeah. is the same way. You're closer to the countertop. Um, and so how do you, how do you mitigate that risk? One thing you can do is you can turn your body and stir with your uh, non-implant side hand. And the other thing to remember is that electromagnetic energy, when it interferes with your device, it takes time to confuse the device. It's not an instant thing. And even if it were, the device takes its time to figure out, is this really a bad rhythm? Um, I think, the, I think I can't remember the exact algorithm, but I think it's like it needs to see 19 out of 25 beats that look suspicious. And so if in that 19 to 25, it sees a couple of normal heartbeats, it resets and it waits for 19 out of 25 to, to say, okay, this is, this is bad. We might need to do something about that. And what happens at that point is real. I, this is real interesting. I like to talk about the, the actual mechanics behind it. Yeah. yeah Once it. it determines there's a, this is if it's a fatal rhythm and, and this is what can happen if, if, if uh, EMI interferes with your device, the, the device takes a little bit of time to say, okay, this is a bad thing. We need to shock this patient. And what most devices do, and actually I think the SICD is the only one that, can't, that doesn't do this, it can't do this. Most devices deliver a pacing treatment called anti-tachy pacing, anti-tachycardia pacing, which is when the heart is in a fatal rhythm, it tries to pace it out of the rhythm. And this is something that you don't feel because it's pacemaking. It's like what a pacemaker does. But they try to deliver that pacemaker pulse at just the right moment in the cycle because... I, I, I've been explained it's kind of a circle from the upper chambers to the lower chambers. The, the electrical impulse is supposed to go through the upper chambers and then down the middle of the lower chambers, and then it starts again at the top. And when you have a fatal rhythm, what happens is it kind of gets this cycle between the upper and lower chamber, and it keeps coming back around. Mm. And so the way it was explained to me is you try to put a little pacing impulse just at the right point of that cycle that breaks the rhythm. Mm -hmm. And that little cycle stops, and then that stops the heart from quivering. So you can get out of a fatal rhythm with this pacing. And it does that while the device is charging the capacitors. And oh. that whole time that it's charging the capacitors, normal charge time is between six and 10 seconds. And so it takes that long to charge the capacitors. Um, while it's doing that, it's delivering this anti-tachy pacing and it's watching the heart to see if anything changes. 
And up until the moment that the shock is delivered, up until that moment, if it sees a normal heart rhythm, it stops everything. It stops pacing. It dumps the charge into the body, which you don't feel. And then it looks again to see what's happening here. And if that rhythm starts up again, the whole process starts over again. Wow. That's so cool. (laughs) Wow. Okay. All right. Good info. Okay. Um, Let's see. Let's get to another question. Oh, uh, let me go back on that one. Let me go back on that one. I just looked at that last question again. Uh, yep, and sure. you asked me, like, what are, what are some of the most common mis- misconceptions? Mm-hmm. Um, yep. I think the biggest one is airport security. And there's a whole story behind that, a whole history where in the 80s and 90s, there was a problem where people were entering magnetic fields. And what happens when you, this, hap- this is what devices have done for decades. When you use a magnet, and I'm going to actually show you a magnet. This is a really big one. Here's a smaller one. If you place a magnet on a device, um, what happens with with pacemakers is most of them, they switch modes. So your pacemaker is in a mode and it's giving you treatment the way your doctor wants it to. If you put a magnet on top of a device, you're you're telling the device, I want you to do something different. And that something different is it switch modes, pacemaker switch mode to what's called asynchronous pacing. So it's no longer looking at your heart, determining if you need help. It's just mm-hmm. saying, I'm going to pace you at a constant rate, no matter what. And that's what it does when a, pace, when a, a magnet is on a pacemaker. Um, this is used by clinicians sometimes when they need to run tests or they want to see how the device is working. Uh, it's, it's actually a design feature. It's not a flaw. It's intended. So you put a magnet on a pacemaker. It switches modes. It paces you at 85 to 110 beats a minute, depending on what company device you have. Yeah. And then when you take the magnet off, your device goes right back to what it was doing. So... No, there's no harm to the device at all. Wait, is that actually when I go to the to the cardiologist for my checkups, they lay something on my ICD? Is that a magnet? Uh, is that something? a programming head, so it's connected to a oh. programmer. It does have yeah. a magnet in it, um, and so yeah, it does have a magnet in it. So if depending on how your device is programmed, that that switch in modes will be automatic or it will not occur. Okay, okay. Mine is set. I think most of them are set where when they place the programming head on the device, the device recognizes the programming head and ignores yeah. the magnet. Oh, okay. Um, okay, yeah. With, with ICDs, though, the problem is if you put an IC, a magnet on an ICD, it doesn't do anything to the pacing side of it, but what it does is it's, it, it's called inhibiting detections. It basically tells the device, don't look at the heart right now. And, and so when not looking at the heart, I mean, it looks at the heart, it's still looking at it, but it, it says, don't do anything that, with what you see. So it's kind of blinding the device. It prevents the device from shocking. That's what it does. So you place a magnet, on a defibrillator, it won't shock. And this is used mostly during surgeries. Like doctors are doing delicate surgery. They, they don't want you to go into cardiac arrest and then your device to shock you and your body. Yeah, 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 yeah. Makes sense. Uh, they, they will protect you externally from that. But yeah. they don't want your device to do that. And so rather than having to have a company rep or a device tech come in and use a program yeah. and change the programming uh. so that it doesn't shock, just put a magnet on it. Mm. It's a simple way to make it not shock. So in the surgery, you'll have a magnet, just like this one actually, sitting on your heart and it won't shock. Take it off, no problem. So in the 80s and 90s, what they were finding is that people were going through airport security, they were going, they were encountering magnets, and their device was switching to that mode, but it wasn't switching out. And they didn't know, <laughs> the patients didn't know that. Wow. So pacemaker patients were being paced at 85 beats a minute, and that's harmless, but it's annoying because you're trying to go to sleep at night and you're getting paced yeah, at 85, yeah. or you're trying to exercise and you're getting paced at 85. So they would go to their doctors feeling horrible and they would find this problem and they would change the device out because the, the programming mode was stuck. With defibrillator patients though, they wouldn't know that they had a problem until they had a cardiac arrest and the device didn't work. Yeah. And so patients were dying. Not a lot, just a couple. Yeah. But the device companies as a whole realized that this is a design problem that we, they needed to fix. And so what they discovered is that there's this little component inside the device that's called a read switch. It's these two little metal prongs that when they come into contact with a magnetic field, they connect and they magnetize and they connect and they complete a circuit. And that switches the device to the other mode. And when you leave the magnetic field, they would separate. And they were in a uh, vacuum sealed tube. And this was about the size of a grain of rice. So these little little uh, hairs, they're little hairs of metal. They're tiny. And what was happening is that little vacuum sealed tube was getting cracked maybe through movement or falling or sports or whatever. And humidity was leaking in and condensing on those little leads. So when they connected, they had this little ball of water that was holding them together. 
and they wouldn't separate. So in the 90s, they changed the design of the device. They removed the reed switch completely. They said, this is a mechanical part that's failing. Let's get rid of it and put something else in. And they replaced it with something called a Hall effect sensor. And this is just a sensor that says, hey, I'm in a magnetic field. I'm going to switch modes electronically. And then it detects mm -hmm. that it's not in a magnetic field. It switches back. Much lower failure rate. I mean, almost zero failure rate. So yeah. they've changed the design of the, of the device because of this problem. But that's not a quick change. That's not something you can do in a year and then have all the devices be you know, safe. It takes you know, three to five years to, to get this change through the FDA, through the other regulatory bodies. And then it takes 10 years to replace all the devices that are out there. Right, so yeah. In the 80s and 90s, they went out and said, tell the doctors, tell your patients, don't play with magnets, don't go through airport security. And that message has stuck, unfortunately. But starting in about 2010, these new devices were on the market. Yeah. So if you had an implant in the last 12, 13 years of any kind, you have a device that does not have a read switch. It has a Hall effect sensor and it is safe in a security environment. Right. At the same time, the security has changed. So they're using much lower levels of magnetic energy. They're much faster. So if you are in a field and your body, your device does react, you're only in that field for a second or two. And your device will switch to one mode and come back to the other. Simple as that. No harm, no doubt, no foul. Um, even the, the millimeter wave scanners, the ones where you put your hands up, those don't even use magnetic energy now. So if, if I had to say that what's the safest airport security measure, it's the one that rotates around you, but they're all safe. You can use them all. And what I do, I just go through airport security. I, I, you know, just like everybody else, I go through. And once in a while, it'll pick up on the fact that I have metal in my body. And uh, you know, the agent will say, oh, do you have anything in your pockets? And I'll say, no, but I have a, I have a pacemaker. I use the word pacemaker rather than defibrillator. It's, it's more well-known. I say, no, but I have a pacemaker. Oh, okay. You know, they say, can I wand you? Yeah, sure. And they, they wand me and they go over my device and that's okay. And then I'm on my way. All right. So that's good info. So people shouldn't worry about air, airport security. No. And the problem is when you're standing in line mm -hmm. at airports in the U.S., there are often signs that say no pacemakers. Oh, in and Belgium too. That's true. Yeah. I've seen that. It's because they actually. haven't updated yeah. their information Nobody's, uh, nobody's gone back out. None of the companies have gone back out with a effort or a message uh, to tell their doctors specifically it's, it's okay. It's safe. Now we haven't worked with the TSA to change that. That's something that'll have to be done. Uh, something I'd like to do in the future if I ever get the chance to. So, so yeah, there's some info that's not up to date yet. Uh, right. <laughs> okay. All right. But, uh, this is good. This is good for people uh, to know what you just shared. Long story. Um, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, great, great. Uh, are you okay with two more questions? Oh, absolutely. Depending on, any, yeah, as many as you like. All right, cool. Um, so, wait, which one did I just ask? Oh, yeah, from Nicole. Uh, let's ask here. This from. Okay, from Summer Woods. Uh, I've had my pacemaker I ICD or slash ICD for three months and have not received any shocks. While this is great news, it leaves so much an anxiety, uh, not knowing what to expect if I do receive a shock. How do most people handle a shock? What percentage of people uh, lose consciousness and for how long? What is my risk of being injured due to collapse from a shock? Is there a reason these devices don't give a warning signal before shock? That's actually something that I'm curious about too. Uh, so a person can sit down or uh, pull their car over. Uh, so in, in, in short, uh, what should you do if you get a shock? And yeah, why do the devices not give a warning before a shock? I love that last question because I've been a part of a discussion. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Yeah. Um, so first of all, yeah, there's, people, there's a lot of anxiety over shocks. Uh, people are worried about shocks. So first of all, I'll say there are inappropriate shocks. We talked about that. It's a really low percentage that you'll get one. And oftentimes the inappropriate shocks happen because of outside influences. So it's because people oh. are using that power drill really close yep. and your device gets confused. That's one reason why inappropriate shocks happen. So you can mitigate that risk by following the recommendations that the medical device companies have, keeping distance between your device and whatever you're using. That's one of the things mm -hmm. you can do to reduce that risk. But they do happen. Um, what I tell people about appropriate shocks is you want that to happen. That's the good thing. That's why you have the device. 
Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about cardiac arrest. Survival rates of cardiac arrest are not good. It's about seven yeah. percent, and that is with CPR. That's with calling nine one one. It's yeah. about seven percent. It gets better with CPR and AED use. Your chance of survival rises. And especially if they start it immediately, the sooner they start CPR, the sooner they get a defibrillator there, your chances go up. But overall, with everybody who has a sudden cardiac arrest, your chance of survival is 7%. With a defibrillator, your chance of survival is about 98%. It's really, really good. Yeah, and so when I talk better. to people who are debating, should I get an ICD? My doctor's telling uh, me I should have an ICD, should I do it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, if your doctor's telling you to wear your seatbelt, are you wearing your seatbelt? You are because you have a higher chance of surviving a crash with sure. a seatbelt. You have a higher chance of surviving, much higher chance of surviving a cardiac arrest. So these are the good shocks. So there are a lot of people who are really anxious about shocks just in general. But really the shocks that you should be anxious about if you're going to be anxious at all are the inappropriate ones. And they're very rare. They happen, but they're really small. It's a really small percentage. The other ones you want to happen because yeah. that's the good thing. That keeps, that's what keeps you alive. Um, so that's important to understand. Um, how many people lose consciousness? Uh, most. I, we, I don't know the numbers exactly, but most. Because they oh, are really? having a fatal rhythm. Their heart is not pumping. And the devices aren't fast enough to deliver a shock. In, in so wait, the they don't lose consciousness because of the shock, but because their heart is doing something not correct. Is that most true? people lose consciousness well before the shock hits seconds before ah, the shock hits. okay i guess um, some people or many people think they lose consciousness because of the shock not usually no that's what i thought no. actually too no there oh. are there are instances where your heart will be going crazy you are feeling super lightheaded you're on yep, the yep. verge of of passing out and you'll get shocked and that's good too that's the device doing its job so those are people who are awake during their shocks and there are people who are awake during shocks and yep. the reaction that I've heard is very different. I've never received a shock, so I can't tell you from personal experience. What I have heard from other people is everything that ranges from, I've, I've heard one person describe it as the most painful thing they've ever experienced. Yeah. Others say it's sudden, it's yeah. a surprise, yeah. but it's over in an instant. It's so like I had a shock, shock from, and I, would, I had a shock. I would lean to what you just said, that it's very, uh, yeah, you, you don't expect it. But it's very yeah, quickly it. over. It's over in an over in an instant. So yeah, and there's yeah. there's no lingering pain. Yeah, there is a risk of you. Uh, well, first of all, collapsing because of your of your heart uh, problem. Um, there's a there's a chance that if you're shocked and you're 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 startled, you could you could fall. You know, especially if you're maybe you're on a ladder or so you're on a balancing something, and, and all of a sudden you get shocked. Yeah, yeah, you could definitely fall. So there is a risk of that. But then you have to look at the risk of how likely are you to have a cardiac arrest at that very moment? So when people say, why are we allowed to drive a car? Well, because cardiac arrests are rare. They, I mean, you know, I think you've had, you've had one, right? I think it's yeah, yeah. one or two. Yeah. Uh, no one. And, and how old are you? I mean, you know, how, think about that. What's the chance? And then, uh, you know, yes, you can, you can be in a car and you can lose control. That has happened. Um, and so you have to take a, take a look at the risk and say, well, Am I going to stop driving a car and on the off chance that I might get shocked sometime in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. or am I going to live my life and yes. do the things that I need to do mm -hmm. and try not to worry about that and yeah. understand that if it does happen, it's more likely to happen at home. Most cardiac arrests happen at home, yes. about 60% of them. Most happen unwitnessed. Most people just collapse and are found later. Yeah. So you have a higher chance of being not in a car not in a dangerous situation. And so, you know, you just, you, you have to look at the risks and the benefits and say, um, this is here to protect me. It's not here to restrict me. That's, a, that's what my doctor tells me. He says to me, I don't want you to ever use your device as a reason to not do something. Anything like you that. want to do, you can. Yeah. And that's what he's told me. So this is there mm -hmm. to protect me. So I can go out and drive my car. I can go out rock climbing and skydiving yeah. and scuba diving, all of which he has approved for me. Every person's mm -hmm. different. So talk to your doctor. Um, but it's there to protect you. So mm -hmm. that's what I try to impress upon people is, uh, yeah, you, you could, you could, you could collapse it behind the wheel. You could, it's really unlikely. It's really, really unlikely that it'll happen at that moment. Um, yeah. The fear, however, is sometimes so big for people that the statistics don't matter. 
And that's really hard, you know, yeah, to emotionally understand that the chances are very low is hard for people. It is. I, 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 t- I totally understand that. And I've, yeah. I have anxiety. <laughs> you know, I worry my brain right. goes crazy at times. Uh, I understand that. I totally understand yeah. that. And so, yeah, I try to talk to people. Um, one, one of the questions you had here was why, why doesn't the device deliver a warning? Oh, yeah. Yep. yep. And that's been, that was an incredible conversation. I just had that probably a year and a half ago with one of the engineers. Uh-huh. And he had told me, yeah, we've had that discussion, you know, every couple of years for the last 15 years. Really? Is mm-hmm. this something we should do? And I went into that discussion thinking that would be a great feature, right? Like if you're behind the wheel and you hear an, an alarm, yeah. I might have two or three seconds to react to that and pull over maybe, right? Um, reality is you wouldn't have, you probably wouldn't have two to three seconds. You'd probably have just enough time to realize something's wrong and either you lose consciousness or, uh, you know, you, you, you just, you don't have time. Um, it's a great idea that we've talked about. It's, it's technically possible, technically possible. But when we talk about things like ATP, remember I talked, I talked about how when the device says, okay, I'm going to shock, it starts to charge, but it also starts that ATP pacing. It can determine at any point during that charge time that everything's okay and we're not going to shock you. Mm-hmm. So when would we deliver that alert? Would we deliver it at the very first second that the device charges? And remember, ATP is really effective. I mean, it works yeah. in 40 to 60% of the time. So if in the rare case that you are going to get a shock, ATP works, you'll hear an alarm and you'll be bracing for a shock that never yeah. comes because ATP works. And so then yeah. what? Are you telling the patient that your device just made a mistake or it just warned you for no reason? Well, no, it, it worked. It did its thing. But the patient doesn't know that. And so my thought is we could do that if we had technology where we could also tell the patient what happened right away in the moment. Right. Yeah. So if, yeah. We had, if we had the connection to the phone yeah, and all of a sudden your phone lights up with a message that says, hey, oh. your, your alarm just went off and here's why. That would be good. Um, maybe that would be good. We don't have that right now. Uh, yeah. None of the companies have any kind of technology like that. Hmm. But maybe we could do that. I would also say it needs it needs to be a feature that could be turned on and off because some people are going to say, I don't, yeah. want, I don't want that warning. This I agree. It's going to mess with my mind. Yeah. Um, and so it would have to be a choice too. What I will, what I'm also thinking is that it could not only be helpful for the person with the ICD, but also for the people around you because they hear a warning sign or sounds. And that could be a sign like, oh, wait, you know, something might be happening with them. Yep. Uh, yeah, I don't know, right? Um, but there's two camps, I guess. Some people might really hate that feature. Some people might really love it. Um, I think I might be more to the side. I might be interested in having some kind of sounds. And yeah, if it could be with your phone, some info why or what. I think that could be more helpful for me. Uh, it could. It would, it would yeah. be... It's it's funny. It sounds simple, but yeah, the but the psychological side, aspects yeah. of it are complicated. And even just the development of that from the industry side is incredibly complex. It is something that would take years to develop. I mean, at a minimum, three years once we decide we're going to go down that path. So it's not something likely to come out as a feature uh, anytime soon. And I guess my argument would be if we, if, if we as, a, as, a, uh, as an industry and as a patient group were to decide this is what we want, it would need to be a conversation that involves patients, that involves doctors, um, probably Definitely. psychologists. I mean, there, it would oh, be yeah. a complex conversation. It would yeah. take time. It would take a long time. So my answer to that is it doesn't give the warning now. That discussion has happened a lot. There's been a lot of debate. And I can tell you, it, it, it's likely not going to be a feature that will be available in the next three to five years even. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, what I, I mean, this is correct, right? If your ICD's battery is almost empty or flat, it will give a sound, right? Yes. That's correct. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Actually, it's looking for a number of different, um, you know, failures or problems. And oh, so okay. it will, it will emit audible sounds if you, if you have a, a problem. And that's an indication for you. It's not something to scare you. It's an yep. indication for you to say the device has detected something different. It's not necessarily dangerous. It could be kind of benign. Yep. Um, you know, like one of the one of the features that I have that says if my thresholds on my lead, if the amount of energy, uh, 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 the resistance it it, it uh, takes, or the amount of energy it takes to make the heartbeat rises suddenly, it'll alarm. 
Now that doesn't mean that it won't make my heart beat or it won't shock my heart properly. It just means that if that something has changed, a measurement has changed beyond a normal range and mm -hmm. it wants the doctor to look at it. I so see. that could be one of the reasons why you receive alert. There are more serious ones like a lead fracture. Now that's something that your device will alert. You'll hear that. And that's something that you want to get looked at quickly. Interesting. So okay. when, a, when a device alerts, also it'll do it when your battery gets low and that's okay. You've got, I think that when the first time you hear the alarm go off, you've got six months of battery life left. So oh, okay. yeah, you're fine. That's, you got plenty of time. Point. It just means, hey, talk to your doctor. Yeah. So anytime you hear an audible alert, it's just an indication that you should talk to your doctor. It's not necessarily serious. It could be, but it's not necessarily. So try not to let the anxiety get to you. Just talk it's to your doctor and they'll tell you. It's a bit like on the car, on the dashboard when, yeah. I don't know, something might be, you know, the oil has to be filled by, you know, you right. could still drive for a while, yeah. but look at it. <laughs> right, so, exactly. It's, yeah, it's yeah. a great analogy. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna throw a last question at you. Okay. okay. Um, okay. This is actually also a good one that I'm curious about. Okay. This is from Sandra Davis. According to Boston scientific website, my son's communicator won't work in some countries. We canceled a trip to Spain for this reason. Uh, my tech savvy husband can't understand why this would be an issue. Is there a way to get around this? I know many choose to travel anyway, but for my son, uh, I don't feel comfortable because his SICD uh, is checked every week yeah, to ensure it's working okay. Uh, also, if he were to be shocked on a trip, uh, yeah, I would want uh, to send a transmission to his health team. Uh, in short, um, yeah, I mean, do some communicators not work in other countries? Is this a thing? Yeah, well, it's so they're designed to work with cellular coverage. So technically yeah. speaking, anywhere you have cellular coverage, it should work. I've taken mine to uh, St. Lucia and it, it could not connect. It just could not connect. But here's the thing, here's the thing that, that people should understand. Your devices are autonomous. They do not require remote monitoring to work. Mm. They will work whether or not you have remote monitoring. All the remote monitoring does is it, it's a, a faster or more efficient way for the doctor to see what's going on with your device, yeah, yeah, especially yeah. if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. But failures with devices are really low. I mean, we're talking like the one to 2% range, really, really low. And most failures are benign or harmless. It's something, something wasn't quite right. We can program it and fix it. And it's not a problem. It, it's not a fatal issue. And, and devices have redundancies built into them. So that if it's supposed to shock and one, one method of that shock fails, it can use another method to deliver that shock. So there's redundancies built into the device so that the chance of a catastrophic failure is really low, like super low. I don't even worry about it. Um, and I worked in the quality group for a time. I saw failures and I saw the catastrophic ones. They are so rare. So it's important to know that you don't need a remote monitor. You don't need it. It's a good thing because it's more convenient. You don't have to go to the doctor's office so often. Um, and really what it's to do is just for them to monitor your device to make sure it's working. So if that transmission is happening every week, there's a really, really, really low chance that one week to the next, there's going to be a failure of any yeah. kind. Mm -hmm. And if there is a failure, there's a really good chance that it's not a catastrophic failure. So um, if you can change that, that uh, transmission time, you can go from weekly to monthly or quarterly, yep. minus quarterly. Every three months, it sends a message. Now, if something does go wrong, it will connect to the, to the um, remote monitor and it will send it to my doctor. And in my nine years, that's happened once. And what happened was it, my, they got a message that said I was having weird rhythms. They looked into it and they realized my device was oversensing. So it was basically double counting heartbeats, meaning if I'm walking around at 70 beats a minute, it thought my heart rate was going 140. It's called T-wave oversensing. And so they called me and they said, you know, just don't exercise until we get you in. And it was like three days before they could get me in. And then they reprogrammed the device to make it less sensitive, which is a good thing. And I've never had a problem since. So what I say to this person is you can bring your communicator with you on vacation. Now I don't. I've been to Europe for 12 days. I didn't bring my communicator I, I, because my device will work without it. It will yeah, save yeah. my life without it. Yeah. And if that happens in Europe or really most places in the world, there are institutions, obviously medical institutions that deal with these devices in Europe. For sure. So yeah. They will be able to analyze the device, look yeah. at what happened, 
and determine, does this need to be reprogrammed? Do you need to have different settings? Was this an inappropriate shock or an appropriate shock? Um, really sending something to your care team in America is not going to help. They're, they're, I mean, maybe they could, they could say, I mean, most of the time when a shock happens, it's, it's because it worked. And so that's all they'd say is it worked. Go about yeah. your day, enjoy your vacation. Um, and that's kind of the way to look at it is again, it's, it's a safety net. Uh, we've had, I, I know people, my, my sister's brother and uh, my sister-in-law's brother was shocked in Japan on vacation and, and it was appropriate. And so what's the response to that? Well, it worked. Get on with your vacation, you know, enjoy the rest of it because you're protected and it worked. That's a bummer. It happened, but you're alive because of this thing. So yeah, get back out there and enjoy your vacation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The lady so yeah, my recommendation too. would be take the communicator with you. Sure. <laughs> but if it doesn't connect, it, your device is still going to work. Yep. Like your son is still protected. Yep. So you don't have to worry about that. And in the rare, rare, rare instance where that event happens while you're on vacation, there are, there are medical institutions there that can take care of you. Definitely. Yes. yes. Okay. So Sandra, don't, uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't, uh, yeah, uh, go to Europe next time. Go to, what was it, Spain, I think? Yes. Yeah, go to I'll Spain. Go to Spain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes, okay. Fun. Yeah. Doc, this was such a good conversation. You shared so many great insights. Like, really, I mean, for me as well, I learned so many new things. So, yeah, thank you. I'm really excited, actually, to release this episode out. <laughs> uh, but thank you truly for taking the time and appearing here on the podcast. My pleasure. It's been fun. All right, and that concludes this episode here with Douglas Racek. I really hope that you learned, uh, yeah, new things about your ICD or about ICDs in general, and that learning about these things made your life in some sense a bit easier. You know, uh, knowledge is power, as they often say, and I personally, truly, I mean, I learned quite a lot here in this episode. So, yeah, I don't know. I feel. Um, I feel a lot more of appreciation towards my own ICD. <laughs> so I hope in a way that you get that feeling of some sense as well. Now to find, you know, any of the resources that Doc mentions in the episode, check out the show notes, which are located in the description of this episode. Uh, or you can also go directly to hardwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Doc. Lastly, if you want to, uh, you know, ask your question to a next expert to appear on the show uh, when we do another Q&A episode like this, uh, then be sure to subscribe to the newsletter as that's where I will make such an announcement and where you can find info about who is to appear next and of course, where you can ask your question then. I will also place a link in the description of this episode, or you can also find the newsletter by going to heartwarriorproject.com slash newsletter. Having said all that, I do hope I get the chance to welcome you again soon on another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. This is Yelis Vaz, signing off. Oh, and one last thing. If you're wondering where to get this amazing looking mug and uh, this amazing looking pullover, that's also very comfy. Uh, we, well, this is some of the merch that we sell uh, on the project, which helps me to continue doing this project. Uh, now we have some different designs. Uh, so on the mug, we have also one with I'm a heart warrior on. Uh, that's explicitly made or, or meant for cardiac arrest survivors. Uh, and each mug has also a beautiful quote. On them to inspire you uh, and we also have that design on the pullover with i'm a heart warrior on uh, and we also have a t-shirt with that design on it now there are also new designs coming soon i'm actually working uh, with a couple of artists that i personally know and i'm very excited about that uh, so yeah i'm creating new designs so they too should be appearing soon in the next coming weeks or months so if you don't like any of these designs uh, then still check out the page as there could be something else that you might like. In the description, you can find a link to check out the merch that we have or, well, we of course also accept donations. So uh, you can also, well, if you don't like any of our merch, leave a donation. So check out the description to find uh, a link or you could also go directly to hardwarriorproject.com slash get involved. Thank you for just, you know, <laughs> listening to this. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, if you would come to support the project, then uh, truly thank you so much. It really helps me to continue doing this. Okay, with that, I hope to see you again on another episode. Bye.